Sounds Good is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. When we were first getting started, getting ready to launch Sounds Good in 2015, making a podcast was hard. But now, thanks to Anchor, making a podcast is not only easy, it is fun. Anchor's creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and basically everywhere else. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Plus, now you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. Even if you're an OG podcast like ours, you can record and produce your show like you always have, but use Anchor as your host. You'll save money, have a superior hosting experience, and get advanced analytics. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. When we scroll through Instagram, we get the chance to see the world through someone else's eyes. Whether it's photos, videos, graphics, art connects us because we all either create art or we consume art, or maybe we do both through social media, the internet, or offline too. And and art has long been an avenue to question, explore, examine, and experiment with what makes us human. And it's provided outlets to express ourselves, to make a statement, or to earn a living. But for far too long, creators of color haven't had equal access to these avenues. And today's guest is working to change that. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Our guest today is Andre Leroux. He is an incredibly talented photographer whose work has been published in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And he's worked with brands like The North Face, American Express, Volcom, Lululemon, and To Write Love on Her Arms, among many other brands you know and love. And if you follow me on Instagram, you have undoubtedly seen me sing his praises. I just love his work. And Andre is an example of someone using their platform to make the world better. He speaks out against racial inequality. He's working to positively change the creative industry from the inside. And he works to increase access and opportunities for other creators of color. And over the last year, I think many of us have been a lot more intentional about maybe trying to do our part in that important work. And maybe we've been doing it on social media, whether it's been being more intentional about sharing important posts on our stories or diversifying who we follow. Those things are good. But I sat down with Andre to talk about how we can take our impact to the next level, how we can do more to support creators of color. And so in this episode, we talk about his unique experiences as a creator of color in the creative community. And he shares three problems creators of color are up against, plus the three solutions that we can all take to heart. And these solutions can truly improve access and opportunity for creators of color. We all have the chance to take action on these and ultimately to become allies for change. And Andre Solutions offer a great place for us all to start. And so I love this conversation. I'm so excited to get into it. So let's just jump right in. Andre, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm I'm just so happy to be talking with you today. Hey, Brandon, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. I I want to start off, and you know, people know that you are a talented and amazing photographer. In the intro, we talked about some of the amazing clients you've shot for. To start off, I want to ask, what's your favorite thing about photography, and what it allows you to do? Photography is really strange because it's one of the only things. Next to, I think, really journalism, where someone will allow you into who they are, into their space, and just trust that you're going to get the best version of them or the them that is appropriate for that moment. And then you just say goodbye. <laughs> it's it's really <laughs> like a really strange thing, but there's this like really quick manufactured intimacy that like no matter who the largest star is or, you know, in terms of our American society, the, you know, the smallest, meekest human, everyone treats photography the same because 
you know, the camera can't lie. And so the energy you give it like is reflective. And so I find photography super fascinating because it is one of those few times where I think we can really find a level of equality between humans um, because we all react to it really similarly. And there's like an honesty in that. As you know, my background is the world of photography. I, I still do photography, but of course, most of my focus is good, good, good. But getting to the place that I got to in my photography career, which was photographing for dream brands, getting to travel the world, getting to support my family with photography, like that had its challenges. But I also know that as a cis white man with a good safety net, there are others who have faced a lot of the same challenges that I face. And then they also faced their own unique challenges. And so I'm curious because we've had a lot of conversations about this. Uh, I'm curious what challenges you have faced coming up in the photography world, uniquely so. And, uh, you know, what has that process been like of, of getting to where you are today? So the thing I want to call out uh, quickly is first, thank you for making the time in this space. Second, for anyone listening and is immediately like, whoa, okay, we're going to get into it. Remember <laughs> that what we're attempting to do here is to raise our level of awareness so that our actions and our desires can match each other. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that like the world that we live in right now is fictitious. It always is. You know, we make the decisions for what we present, for who are our movie stars, who is the most desirable face, who has the most money. Like if these things are correlating, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is it a nature or a nurture thing? And so as we continue this conversation, I want everyone to start with an open mind and to understand that things I'm describing are my experiences specifically, but they're meant to inspire a concept of solidarity in you. So I'm actually going to start with something that's not photography related. When I was a kid, uh, we moved here from Jamaica when I was three years old. Um, and my mother, like all mothers, believed that I was uh, remarkably intelligent. And so when I was in second grade and um, my teacher, Ms. Algarten, told my mom that I should uh, take the gifted test. She was like, well, of course, you know. <laughs> but then when my mom went to go get the gifted test, uh, just to sign up for it after school one day, she, you know, went to pick me up, but she went to the office first. She went in and said, hi, hello. Um, my son's teacher asked to get him a gifted test. And the woman said, oh, you must be mistaken. You, do you need the e, does he need the ESOL test? My mom was like, no, he needs the gifted test. And she actually wouldn't give it to her. It's one of my favorite little fun stories about young America. Um, and so the reason why I bring it up is when the expectation, once like what we believe of this fiction that we've created becomes an expectation, it becomes a dangerous weapon. And so what do I mean by that? As we're talking about challenges you face, we've all faced imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is the concept that we don't belong somewhere because we don't have the right accolades, we don't have whatever it is. But imposter syndrome mixed with racism is very dangerous because we have to ask ourselves the question, where are we allowed to be? If you think about how in the past, people of color, black people, Latinx people have been portrayed in the media. Think about the caravans of people coming <laughs> allegedly um, to the U.S. that they were covering um, in the media. Or if you think about just various specials and things that just let us know that we think that black is bad or evil. All photography students or photographers in general know the story of when Time Magazine uh, burned the edges of the O.J. Simpson photos so made them look darker and more dangerous. But then we have to ask ourselves a question, what happens if you're considered more dangerous? So, you know, on the little senses, there's times I've gone to client meetings, waited in the, in the lobby of a building, and then the security is like, oh, no, no, deliveries are in another place. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm not here to deliver any food, dude. Appreciate you, though. Those things are annoying. But on a main level, when you take the concept of... Um, imposter syndrome, and you mix it with scarcity, it becomes a really dangerous amount of anxiety. What do I mean by scarcity? So if you're listening to this, maybe you grew up poor. Um, and so you understand the concept of scarcity mindset. Um, every purchase feels anxious. It's, it gives you anxiety. Even if you have enough money for it, you know how quickly things can go away. And so to have had, to have not had, and then now had is really kind of a burden. And then if you mix that with the concept that all of your favorite black artists, black creators, even if you believe them to be the most talented of anything in the world, have less access to general opportunities. What do I mean by that? There was a the statistic, I should have brought it up, but um, you shared it on your story. I believe it was from an influencer's Instagram page. And it was that, you know, last year, and maybe we can, if you can find it, I'll reference it, but the overall payment between black and white influencers or black and white creators um, was, I think it was like a, a half or a, f a third or something of the overall payment for that. And so what happens is not only are you 
likely to be poorer because of systemic American things, but you are likely to have less opportunities to bite at the apple. And what that means is less opportunities to bite at the apple, less opportunities to get more gear, less opportunities because you have less money to try new art and to just invite all of this stress on top of the fact that you can get on your Instagram and people can be like, well, you only got this because you're black and this isn't that good. And um, Sir Williams isn't a champion and all the other weird things people say about black people that are just awful. And those things, as we're coming back to them as experiences, are reflective of our belief that this system that we have is just and right. Um, and so really what I want to say is of the experiences that I can mention, the black creators that you know are going through so many dangerous things every day. They're trying to code switch between um, where they grew up and the spaces they're in now. They're trying to convince clients to pay them more money. They're trying to convince clients to have um, people of color in their advertising. I've had things before where people are like, oh, no, you, that's too black. We need more of this thing. And you're like, okay. And really what's going on is sometimes that happens because we're trying to reflect the America that we know or the the product that we know or the fact that, you know, I think statistically uh, black Americans take up 13% of the population. But if we were to look at like our gap ads or anything like that, we're going to not see that portrayed. And so that goes all the way back to if the imposter syndrome question is, should I belong here? Then how are black people supposed to feel? If I'm not portrayed in any spaces except for like McDonald's ads um, and in violence, where is supposed to be for me? And if I am lucky enough to become a well world-renowned artist or a well-paid artist, then I not only have to represent all of Black people all the time, which is stressful in itself, but I then also have to figure out how to make sure everyone around me is taken care of. And so quickly that money becomes community money. And now that scarcity mindset creeps itself back in and continues in a cycle of a cycle of a cycle. And so that stress is very, very real. And so if you're listening to this and the only thing that you took away from this is how do I make sure that the black people that I know in my life feel comfortable in the spaces I make for them and in the business spaces, just ask them, listen to them. Well, and that's what I'm excited to kind of get to ask about, you know, today from your perspective, at least. And, and first of all, thank you for sharing all of that. I want to have a conversation in this episode about how we can create a more equitable future for all creators. And for the purposes of this conversation, because there's so many different ways to be a creator, let's talk about the kind of worlds that you and I live in a lot of, which is creators like photographers, designers, and social content creators. Because I think also most listeners, that's who they're interacting with on, say, Instagram every day. And so I know that this probably applies to a lot of those other industries, but we'll zoom in. And so you've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but what are three problems you see many creators of color facing? First, it's a lack of opportunity. There is a concept that PDD talks about. PDD talks about the concept of like all people of color are fighting for the 0.8%. It's, I think it's like the percentage of GDP or the black market or something like that. And what I mean by that is think about your, some of your favorite artists of color and think about, or even your favorite artists on the gender sexuality spectrum or women, look at when they're getting most of their work. A lot of times it'll be, oh, we're with this alcohol brand to celebrate Women's History Month, Black History Month, Frederick Douglass's birthday, or I don't know, whatever other thing that people want to celebrate. And you might get that one large check one time, and then it's crickets for a lot of the year. And so, yeah, it's great to have time to yourself to not work on client work, but people see you to live and eat. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and do an audit. Look at the uh, at the client work that creators that you think are of similar skill levels or similar follow accounts are doing. And if you Cross racial lines generally and sexuality lines, you will see a huge disparity in the amount of work. And I'm talking about as a whole, right? And so it really kind of, for creators of color, you fight that concept of white mediocrity, right? And I'm going to say this and people are like, okay, well, I'm not mediocre. Yeah, I mean, I am. I'm reasonably mediocre and I can recognize that as a man, there are things that I've gotten away with. And so it takes a little bit of self-reflection, but recognizing that often the mediocre white artist will get a job that a super talented artist of color might not have the opportunity to do. And generally it's okay because that that's thought of as okay because, you know, agencies and all creative is subjective. But when we happen over time and time again, we start to ask the question, what is it that we're doing wrong? Or why don't we have access to this thing? And why am I only getting these niche projects or niche clients or whatever that is? Like, am I not as good to photograph this rant, regular lifestyle brand thing um, that doesn't just involve black people? Like, for y'all that know my work, you're like, wow, Andre's super good. If you really look at it, 
I do a lot of black celebrity work, right? I work on Kamal show, about to direct something else with a black celebrity. I did the thing with Ludacris. But if you separate out like black stuff, I would still say like generally I'm like under similar creators or even creators that I think maybe don't make the same things uh, to the same level that I do. And, you know, that's something I have to deal with myself. And maybe that means I need to get better. But more often than not, we need to recognize our own internal biases. So that's one. Number two, after people don't have enough money. So if we go back to the conversation about imposter syndrome, let's talk about how for black creators, often on the space on the internet, you can feel like you don't want to be there. You, or you're not supposed to be there. You can make a piece of art and then folks are in the comments like, oh, you know, this is they only hired this person because they were black or they're very aggressive or intense. Personally, for me, one of my least favorite moments, I worked with the North Face. I love the North Face. Eric Hanna, shout out, some of my favorite folks. They have an organization inside the North Face called the Explorer Fund where they take North Face money, they donated to organizations that make climbing accessible for everyone. They had their 10-year anniversary last year, and they hired me to take photos originally. Then COVID happened, and I was like, I'm not going to Seattle. (laughs) And so instead, I interviewed people digitally, took photos over Zoom. This was such a good series, by the way. I loved this. It was so fun. And like, basically, the two orgs were just really stood out. Or actually, all of them were amazing. But the ones that I want to bring up are Paradox Sports. They are incredible. Their organizational mission is to help adaptive climbers. So that could be folks that have a hard time hearing, a hard time seeing, or missing an appendage, and just allow them to still get outside, to hike, to climb, like all this cool stuff. And so we highlighted them. Everything was hunky-dory. Everybody was happy. I used hunky-dory for the white people. Um, Everybody was happy. And then the next one was an organization called Outdoor Afro that was just like, hey, we like making spaces for black people to get back outdoors. And the number of comments that were like, this is racist, that North Face is stupid. Why would anyone do this? Who is this guy, Andre, that made this stuff? How dare you? Like, black people want to take over everything. Okay. Sure, that's not the case. And so that is such a frustrating thing. You finish a piece of work, you're so excited to celebrate it. And it's very telling that the only organization that got a lot of hate was this one that was centered around a black experience. Mm. When it's not a disability, but it's important that we have to ask ourselves, why is it that more black people aren't outdoors? It could be because of cost. That's a large part of it. We could also start to understand that there were whole portions of American history where there were different beaches, different places that black people could not go. And so when you get used to something, that stuff gets passed generationally. Come on. What do we think these things are? We love to think in America that like things that happened in the past don't affect us. That's not how that works. So that's the second thing is just um, you can finish a piece of work and then just have to deal with the fact that you're constantly being questioned in this way that is just derogatory it's frustrating and it's a question of your identity so much of any creator photographer videographer illustrator writers work is art and that art is a part of their soul so if you continue continuously being invalidated that how loud that imposter syndrome can get can be deafening so that's two for three i think as we've started to push for social justice we have to recognize as we want to make more people see inequities It could be super traumatic. Look, George Floyd was murdered, and that was, man, (laughs) it was enough to make my mom mad. My mom is a very calm woman. My mom called me and said, I don't even know why I I moved us to to America. That's a Mm. big thing for her to say, considering the amount of work she did. And I remember just that whole time, I couldn't even use my phone for days. It was days of just texts and phone calls. Every time you open the internet, it's just like black pain, black pain, black pain, black pain, black pain. And so it's almost this thing where on the internet, it's difficult because your art is most valued when you show the pain of this. But it's like, I we're not a monolith. There's so many other parts of us. And so in summation, pay us, don't invalidate us, and then be very careful about what you're sharing and your understanding of it. The shock value of the black pain is not as important as your understanding as the systems that let us get to there. So if you want to take time, and this is something I think it was really good about this summer was it was the birth of the explainer guide. I'm sure these existed before, but Instagram was just flush with these where someone could say, hey, you want to know what systemic racism is? Here's redlining, et cetera. So people essentially took Adam Ruins everything and just made it into a bunch of slides. <laughs> and it was really powerful because all of a sudden folks were like, oh, I can use my story to share step by step the thing that has made this thing possible, Right. So that, I think, was a good example, but I think we can still do a better job of understanding how to not just weaponize the internet so that black people are like there to make you sing and dance and then um, be another black buddy that's dead in the street. This is super helpful, and I want to get into how I and listeners can 
counter to these problems, how we can create solutions to these problems and be a part of of fixing these things where we have the ability. But first, I want to kind of cast some vision for what a world looks like when all artists, when artists of color have equal opportunity to work, to create, to share their work. What does that vision look like? What does that potential better future look like? It looks like um, getting to cast a fictional mermaid or a superhero as any person and everyone is just cool with it because they recognize that the story of that superhero, of that fictional person is one that we can all um, embrace and that maybe our embrace of it being a white man or a ginger woman is just what we did then. And we can change the new things. And so it looks like us making space for each other. It looks like a larger amount of collaboration. Um, Like, for example, I've been thinking a lot about, I've been kind of going out of my way to make more friends on the internet that aren't cis, aren't white, aren't black, just different folks. Earlier this month, I was on a call for screenwriters. It was just like, a if you want to get into screenwriting, I don't want to. I just want to learn about it. And my friend Mamadou, who's amazing, he writes for... um, Space Force on Netflix. So he had some of the writers on there. And this writer said something that burned into my memory that I want to bring up here. She said, you know, as I started, the first one or two scripts I wrote, the main character was like a 35-year-old white dude. She's like, I'm like a queer Asian woman. And it was just the easiest thing for me to write because it was the thing that was most presented to me. It was the Everybody Loves Raymond. And I, look, shout out to Ray Romano. It was the Seinfelds. It was, it was all the things that we see consistently and so what an equitable world looks like is it we can reboot Seinfeld, and if we don't have to, I don't think we should, but <laughs> it can have a different cast of characters. You can reboot Friends and have a different cast of characters. Like Seeing everything in one perspective is very dangerous for us. And it's boring, too. You know, it's like, imagine the stories that could be told that are going completely untold. Yeah, of course. I mean, think about like... Think about a story about a young, queer, Latina woman who wants at her quinceanera to dance with a woman that she cares for. Like, what does a quinceanera court look like that's queer? It might be very beautiful. It might be more colorful. It might be less stiff dancing. I've been to a lot of those, and 15-year-old boys do not know how to dance. (laughs) And so um, basically what that future looks like is it's one where we collaborate more. So what I mean is when a brand reaches out, I can say, or you can say, hey, you know, I would love to work with you. Who else are you working with? And if that roster isn't like a proper index of who this target market is. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, uh, for example, we're talking about Walker & Company. I work at Walker & Company. Obviously, Walker & Company is going to index more with people of color. But if you work on a product that is for everybody, like for a plant company, I can't see why it shouldn't include every potential kind of human. As many things on the spectrum as possible. And someone might say, well, that's, you're shoving it down our throats. No, mm-hmm. sir, ma'am, person, human. It, this has existed for a long time. We've just chosen to invalidate it. So now as we regress back to the mean of making it seen, it feels like violence. But in actuality, violence is what got us to the erasure of these things in the first place. So that equitable future just looks like one where we are collaborating, where opportunities are more equitably given. Creative is still subjective. We're not going to be able to step out of that. But there shouldn't be a reality where you and I are getting the same job. You obviously have more followers than me, but if we had similar number of followers, I shouldn't be getting offered half, three quarters of that. We already did that. We did the, what was that, the three-fifths compromise? I'm not trying to go back to that. So we should get paid appropriately. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Andre is sharing how we can all be a part of supporting creators of color. His three simple action steps provide a roadmap to be an ally to the artists we love. We'll be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by Riff. Now, we all love coffee, and of course, we know that coffee, the beverage, comes from the coffee bean. Uh, But what we oftentimes forget is that uh, that bean comes wrapped in a fruit, a juicy pulp that surrounds the bean called cascara. And the bad news is that each year, a ton of cascara is literally thrown away, piled into literal mountains in landfills, producing methane gas equivalent to the emissions of 3 million cars each year. But the good news is that the folks at Riff have a solution. They are upcycling this delicious cascara into a carbon-neutral, plant-powered energy drink called Energy 
Plus. Now, Rip Energy Plus Immunity has 120 milligrams of caffeine, a daily dose of vitamin C, and it comes in three delicious flavors. Booyah Berry, Get It Guava, and Pick It Up Pomegranate. It is so delicious. I've got some in my fridge right now. I truly recommend it. Plus, I love that they found a creative solution to a problem that is going unaddressed. What an incredible company. To learn more about Riff's mission and their new Riff Energy Plus immunity, visit letsriff.com and use the code good, good, good for 20% off your order. One more time, that's letsriff.com and use the code good, good, good. Sounds Good is sponsored by Happily, the maker of Datebox. Datebox is everything you need for a romantic and fun date night right in your home, right in a box. They even include a custom playlist and conversation starters for your date. With easy sign up, flexible plans, and fast shipping directly to you, what more could you ask for? So I am actually a Datebox user. Every month I get a new date box shipped straight to my house. I actually just got an email that my date box is out for delivery. It will be here soon. I will keep you updated on how it goes, but it is so nice to be able to have something to take the pressure off of date night, to create an experience for you and your partner that you can do from the safety of your own home. And it also is great on the wallet. Sometimes you don't want to do this huge ornate date out in the world. You want to do something at home that's fun, memorable, and affordable. And speaking of affordable, Datebox is offering Sounds Good listeners 50% off their first box. All you have to do is visit thehappily.co and use the code good, 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 all one word. One more time, that's thehappily.co and get 50% off with the code good, good, good. So we've talked about the problems. Now let's talk about the solutions because you know these are deeply systemic things, but we all have a role to play in creating that change. And so for the first thing, this lack of opportunities for creators of color to take on projects, to uh, get work, and then of course the financial component of that as well. What can I, for example, do to push back against that lack of opportunity, create more opportunity for artists and creators of color. Okay, so for high-level creators, we we talked about this earlier, but creators with taste, because I I love this, but the internet will forever celebrate people that are tasteless, and I don't know how to to fix it. It's just what it is. (laughs) But the first thing is, all those lists that we were sharing last summer, the like Black creators I like to follow, those lists are great for your Instagram, but you know what? Instagram is actually a really hard place to drive CTAs. Shout out to any marketing people that listen to this and know what I mean. Instead, take that list and anyone you know that is hiring creators, so agency people, small businesses, just share it with them one-on-one. Just like if if I had a car that I was like, yo, Brandon, you got to get this, man. It's crazy. Like this four-wheel suspension. I, actually, I don't know. I don't even know if that makes sense. The suspension is crazy. Two non-car guys talking cars. <laughs> I love this. So I put a subwoofer in it. No. So, um... The most effective form of marketing is word of mouth. And so maybe it isn't sharing every BLM post. It's saying, okay, who in my life can collaborate with a black creator? If you own a coffee shop, like, or if you know someone owns a coffee shop, just say, here, here's some black creators I think are cool. Maybe we can get their art in here. Like taking a minute to recognize what's around you, what you have access to, and then how you can bridge that access to other people. The access that you create makes access for other people. You probably don't realize the access that you have, but when you activate that, it really makes a better environment for everybody. So being equitable starts with recognizing what you have access to. And sometimes it's as simple as like during the quarantine or during quarantine, during COVID, buy nothing groups have been exploding. They are a group where essentially what happens is someone says, oh, I have this couch. I don't really need it. Or I'm moving or we've changed our taste. And instead of just throwing it out on the street or trying to sell it, saying, hey, you know what, this might go to someone who could need it and just making that available. You might have access to that coffee shop or a small art gallery or, you know, a hardware store that just needs headshots for 
their business and just being able to say, hey, here's someone like take those people you're following and turn them from Internet people that inspire you into real life people that you can work with, Mm. Um, especially people that you work locally with. It'll really change a ton of things. That's the best way to do it. Like, I'm sure if you I don't know if you saw the Fred Hampton movie, but Judas and the Black Messiah was really powerful because you saw a lot of him brokering deals to create access for more people. And that's really what it boils down to, right? If we can recognize inequity enough to have free and reduced lunch and have things when children are children, we have to recognize when they grow into adults, these things don't just magically go away. So what I'm hearing is sharing a post on social media praising Black creators, creators of color, or one in particular isn't inherently bad, but you could do so much more. And so with that exact same energy, when you see that kind of thing, think about what access do I have that I can give to other people that I can share with these creators that I admire? Yeah. And it it probably doesn't take you that much time. Just send an email or write it down, like take it elsewhere, right? It will be really powerful for you. I promise buy their art if you can. And if you can't afford to like, um, if for any church kids out there, remember we learned about the concept of the tithe. Well, I remember forever ago when someone was foolish enough to let me speak about the Bible, they don't let me do that anymore. I, I, talked about the concept of a tithe when we were in high school being something of your time because it's the concept Mm. of delivering something that is valuable to you and offering it on to someone else or to something greater than yourself. And so if you don't have money, that's fine. Figure out how to make time, give time, or give access to another human that could use it. And I promise you, if you reach out to a Black artist and say that, they might say, oh, I don't need that. But what you can say instead is, okay, so who do you think I could share it with instead? And like, think about that. Black Paul Octavius has a black archivist, and that's the entire concept. He just is getting cameras from people that don't use them to give them to people so they can make their stuff. Photography is so expensive. All art is expensive to make. There's all these barriers to entry based on cost. And so cutting those things down, reducing them is super helpful. This is so good. Let's move on to the second problem and create a second solution. The second problem was essentially when we see racism on social media, and especially when the work of artists of color is attacked or the artists of color themselves are attacked. What can we do about this? What can I do this as somebody who wants to be a thoughtful member of society and ally? So a couple things. First and foremost, don't ever knock on the calm voice text message or phone call. Mm. If you know the person who says some wild stuff, you can reach out to them and say, hey, this isn't cool for this reason. And also remember, Prejudice isn't always super loud. Um, Sometimes it's in a little comment. I'm not telling you to get upset with the comment. I'm asking you to be aware. If something makes you feel strange, go do some research, then get back to the person and say, hey, what you said wasn't super accurate because of this thing. And I just wanted to say that to you because I want us to be better understanding. I Not in terms of we're going to cancel anybody or anything like that, first and foremost. Second thing, if you see something negative, I'm a proponent of responding to it, not in an effort to win the argument with the person, but because when... Horrible things go unchecked, um, especially on Instagram. Twitter is different because, like, generally, it, I think Twitter filters it better, and like, it's easy to see if it's like an egg with eight followers or like, you, no followers follows a million people. That's one thing. But if it's on Instagram, especially, respond calmly. But also, you have to recognize that your comments are important because they show to the other people who majority of people don't comment on things. Just they show them how to manage that. So someone says oh, hey, like, why do I need their own space to hike? For someone to go in and respond and say, hey, here is an opportunity to understand that for water, for example, there was Negro parts of the beach, there was parts of the beach that white people could go to. There were um, swimming pools that white people could go to, and et cetera. So now if they take the students to learn how to swim or just get in the habit of doing it, it's about letting them know that it's for them. And then if they keep going, like, you don't have to say anything else, but the concept is just making sure you meet that intensity with, Kindness, understanding, but most importantly, facts. Keep it succinct, but just recognize that there are a lot of people who are going to read, hear, and watch whatever this is. And just being able to make sure that you respond to it accurately is helpful. Don't dogpile. Don't freak out. I'm not saying that because I don't want everyone to like fight racists. I'm not like pro protecting racists, but it's one of those things to help kind of sue some of the respectability people that like someone might say like I hate this black person, and then I'm like I hate you, and someone else will respond to me like Wow, I can't believe he said he hated somebody, and it's like No, 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 you missed the point of that. So just try to be as kind as you can, and then if you still are upset, you can text one of your friends separately, and be like Yo, this is so horrible. 
it takes some energy for me to respond to some of those comments or to have that conversation with a friend. But I can't imagine how much more painful it would be if the racist language was attacking me personally and I had to do that communicating. And so the least I can do is use my privilege to have that conversation, create some change. And you know, when doing so publicly, help ensure that it's not your job as a Black creator to be the one being the first to see those comments. It's got to feel a lot more helpful to scroll through your comments and go, okay, good. I've got some other people who are, who maybe have my back on this and I can spend my time creating, going out and making something positive. And it's a team effort. It is a team effort. And we have to recognize this. In a perfect world, we would solve racism tomorrow. But if even if we did that, we'd still have prejudice we have to deal with. We have to deal with how we treat poor people. We have to treat with, deal with how we treat trans people, how we treat homeless people. And so often there are all three of those people all wrapped together. And that's not a mistake. And so we're learning how to, how to flex these muscles now to prepare for new changes and things that require our understanding and empathy later. And so right now, as we're watching people um, call Jeremy Lin coronavirus or whatever they were calling him, or a ton of like anti-Asian hate and violence, like you need to meet it with that exact same energy because that's ridiculous. (laughs) You think someone's Asian, they gave you COVID? Like, come on, bro. But the energy that we have for it has to be just as protective and just as important. Now, some people might feel differently. I mean, you can ask them like, oh, someone comments, should I say anything? And they say, or they DM me later and say, don't say anything. Then, okay, cool. Maybe they'll delete the comments. But for me and for a lot of folks, don't make them have to do more work than existing and creating and then also defending their existence and creation just to exist and create more. This is super helpful. And as the last way that we can make a difference in, in kind of our last question of this conversation, the final problem that you spoke to is this idea of, of a lot of people sharing trauma on social media when they could be being more thoughtful, more proactive, and less traumatizing in the things that they share. What can we do to create a solution to that? Read books, read The Color of Money, um, read The History of Racist Ideals. I believe that's the name of the Kende book. Read books that expand your understanding, but also let you speak more with more clarity when these things come up. You can also reference things without directly sharing them. Like sometimes when you share them, the concept is, I saw this and I'm here for you. It's not wrong as a thing, but like I'm not really trying to watch my man. I saw the George Floyd video on accident. That's when I was like, mm. this is too much. I was just scrolling and I was like, what is this? Oh my God, right? That shouldn't happen, right? Because really at the end of the day, you see it and you go, oh, that really could be me. Or like when the Amy lady happened in Central Park, I was like, oh, yikes. This 100% could have happened to me. When Ahmaud Arbery died, I wrote something that I now regret, not because of what I wrote, but because I was just learning how to do those text guides and I did like a light pink on a white, so it was horrible to read. (laughs) I'm so sorry, especially for accessibility and do a better job. But um, for Ahmaud Arbery, I had an experience where um, a car pulled up, stopped me on the side of the road and said, what are you doing here? Why? Like, where are you going? And I was like, what? And they were like, who are you? Where are you going? Stop and talk to us right now. And they followed me and it's scary, right? And so, you know, maybe I didn't really want to see him get shot just personally um, because it it brings on a lot of stressful, harmful feelings, depression, fear, et cetera. Like the best way I would describe it, remember that fear that we all felt on 9-11 because we recognize that that could have been any of us? That's like a very normal thing for black people. And so when people say, well, what about this? Or what about Chicago or whatever? It's like, okay, well, first of all, Chicago is just a red herring. I'm not going to discuss that. But more importantly, if you are going to what about me, then you have to recognize the degree and the level of stress that I deal with on a daily basis. It's a thing that you and I talked about. I've talked about before. There's a Chris Watt quote. I'll never forget it. In one of his stand-ups, he says, (laughs) he said, none of you, no white person in this room would switch places with me and I'm rich. And that says a lot about what we think about the emotional health, the trauma that is present for uh, black people now. So essentially what I mean is don't bother your black friends all the time with questions. Don't bother your friends of color with questions all the time. Spend time reading things and then be present to listen when they choose to share it with you. And, you know, as much as we want a virtue signal, if you want to share how you feel about something that's traumatic, you can share it without showing the visual of it. You can just say, hey, I saw this and it was scary to me. If anyone wants to talk about it, they can DM me or whatever. And then for the people around you that maybe are woken up by that violence, the people who previously had decided not to be allies, you can then come with your educated self, more educated self to them and say, I don't know everything, but here are the things that I learned, why this is destructive or why this thing happened, why he knelt on his neck for several minutes, why Breonna Taylor was shot and killed in her home and nothing happened. Like just recognizing that um, 
instead of sharing the violence, share where it sits on this pantheon of this has happened to black people a million times already and why it's so painful, destructive and, you know, expected at this point. I think what I'm hearing as well is that I don't need to go and share how this emotionally makes me feel because the trauma is going to make people of color feel so much more pain. And so instead, I need to take how that makes me feel and use that to create something that's a little bit better. And that might just be education. That might be inviting more people into the conversation. It might be some historical context. But if I can turn me feeling sad or heartbroken that this happened into something that helps bring an end to this, that is more important than just sharing the trauma itself. 100%. And at the end of the day, just be okay with with correcting folks. I mean, it's it's the same thing as we've treated other things in the past where you're just like, hey, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. Or, you know, we don't just live in a world where people can say whatever they want to us. That's not how consent works. And so we shouldn't be able to just make people see things because we decide to see them. Like, let's just be more intentional in how we care for each other. That's beautiful. Um, as one last question, if somebody is just finishing this episode and they want to go out and take one positive action step to support artists of color, creators of color, what's something they could do right now? Two things. First, I'm going to pick the shortest thing I can think of. Read Letters from Birmingham by Dr. King. Mm. <laughs> That'll do something for you. <laughs> It'll just kind of warm you up to the concept of systemic racism and what that does emotionally. Um, if you think of the the hero that's made of Dr. King, listen to those words first. Number two, look in an organization like Diversify Photo, Authority Collective, and follow them and just listen, pay attention to what they're doing. They will share artists, they'll share print sales, and you can find other artists that you love in that way. And, you know, worst comes to worst, if that many of you are having a lot of questions, DM Brandon about it, and I'm sure he will write something that will um, show you just artists that he thinks are cool. Um, and very lastly, find black female artists and find black trans artists they're making so many beautiful things right now that will challenge what our concept of beauty is and our concept of you know who's allowed to be where because they've had to struggle with so many things and so here we all know that real struggle makes beautiful beautiful art so go find those That's artist Andre LaRoe. You can see his incredible photography and his amazing education by following him on Instagram at Andre. That's A-U-N-D-R-E. You can also see his work on his website, AndreLaRoe.com. Truly, I am a huge fan of this guy's work. I love learning from him. Whether you're a photographer or not, I cannot recommend enough that you follow along with everything he's doing. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. And you can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. If you want to support this show, there are two things you can do. First, please hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts so that next week you can get another episode of Sounds Good delivered straight to your phone while you sleep. And then the second thing is, if you love this episode or if you've got a favorite episode that you want to share with the world, the best way to do that is to head on over to Spotify, search for that episode, and then hit the share button to post it straight to your Instagram stories. It does that cool little thing where people can click on the episode and it'll open straight up in Spotify so they can start listening right away. It is a great way to fill your Instagram stories and your friends' lives with a little bit more hope, a little bit more good news, and a little bit more good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and support creators of color. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?